So my, my first in introduction to you, John, was following a talk that you gave at the Action for Happiness event in London. At, at the um, Friends Meeting House there, right? Yeah. And so I didn't attend that event because I didn't know about mindfulness and I didn't know oh, about really? meditation at that point. But my, my co-host, Anne, who's a maths teacher, who'd been introduced to mindfulness through one of the MB, was it MB, MBSR. MBSR programs. So, so thanks to you. Um, and he told me about this mindfulness and I was like, you know, well, what is mindfulness? And I think, I thought that I understood the concept. Now in the Q&A section at the end, Anne asked the question. My question to you was regarding the London riots of 2011. And I said, you know, if, if you could perhaps pass on a message to, because at the time when I was teaching at the college, this particular college was uh, at one of the scenes of the, where the, the riots took place in London and how perhaps mindfulness could change their world view. So I asked you if, if you could perhaps think of a message. What would you say to them if you could, could say something? You know? What did I say? All right, so well, one of the, the amazing answers that you did give to us, John, was that we should reach out to the Mind Body Awareness um, Project you know, in Oakland, California. Right. Because they deal day to day, you know, going into the prisons and dealing with at-risk youth, incarcerated youth. And did you do that? We reached out to them. So we, we spoke to Sam and Micah, um, and they, they were amazing, you know, senior instructors there. And, you know, we had great contact that a yeah, year... Yeah, I know Sam. Yeah, Sam Himmelstein. Yeah. Right. And you were, the, you were the foreword to his last book, right? That's correct. A year later, we then, we reached out and we spoke with Roger Miller, the executive director. Wonderful. I'm so glad you made that connection. Yeah. So following that first podcast we did with them, it then led me on a journey to find out what mindfulness was, you know, because I, I scheduled the end of the podcast with them without having meditated myself. But right. following the stories that they told me and then my research into it, the next 40 podcasts that we did on, the, on our, our own podcast was around the subject of mindfulness and happiness, um, which not only became the main theme for our podcast, but the main theme in our lives. So, you know, I just wanted to begin with... I'm with a, with a, I am to hear that because, you know... You say yes to give it in a talk, uh, you know, I mean, I'm friends with uh, Lloyd Layard, Richard yeah. Layard, yeah. Uh, and uh, you never know what's going to come of something like that. So, you know, I'm so touched to meet you guys on Skype, yeah. basically, and hear that something that I said affected you so deeply that you pursued that thread and 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 have uh, and it's affected your lives yeah we try to embody it as much as we can and with the partnership with action for happiness you know one of our last episodes got 10,000 hits you know it's, it's, so it's just going with, out to affect uh, go on to yeah. helping others in the, in the London community you know, yeah and, and help aligns us with our message of how can we help you know <laughs> spread this fantastic message because right. And, you know, and I guess what we want to talk about today is not so much, you know, what is mindfulness and the introduction to mindfulness. It's that given that we have meditated and have been meditating for several year now, years now, and the many questions that have come up along the way about the relationship with our own thoughts and, you know, our, the way that we handle stress and depression and anger. And also, the, well, how do, we, how, how do we live that altruistic life where we thrive? You know, Ariane, Ariana Huffington mentioned in that talk you did with her about, you know, not only, but, but thriving. You know, we're not, we're here just to not be depressed. We're here to actually be happy. So, John, perhaps, can, can, you, can you give us, you know, after hearing that, a bit of background as to, you know, what were some of your major learning points, you know, la last year, as, as far as this, this mindfulness, um, can we call it a movement? I was <laughs> you can call it whatever you like. Yeah, uh, the... It's becoming more and more popular, as you know. Sure. Uh, this podcast is just an example of that. Uh, for many, many years, the only people that knew anything about mindfulness were Buddhists and Buddhist meditation practitioners. Uh, uh, but in the past 15 or 20 years, uh, interest has been um, exponentially rising to the point where it is now everywhere. In the U.S., you can't every day open the New York Times and there's something about mindfulness. Yeah. Now, 
I'm very sort of, I think that's a very positive thing, but at the same time, the more it gets into the mainstream of society, the more easily it could be misunderstood, denatured, or become some kind of hip hype. Uh, and that would kill it. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the way to have it maintain its integrity is to remember, first of all, that mindfulness is not a nice idea and it's not a philosophy. It's a way of being. And it involves cultivating uh, a certain relationship with your own experience through awareness. And it turns out that's very hard work. Yes. So we're asking a lot of people. We're not asking a little of people when we invite them to, say, take an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program because they have... Uh, uh, chronic pain conditions or heart disease or whatever it is, we're saying, no, being human, you have a profound capacity to actually regulate the activity of your own mind and befriend your own experience even when you hate it, even when it's terrifying, mm -hmm. and find ways to be in wiser relationship with your own exact experience. And then that's where health and healing and happiness actually lie. Yes. But I don't want to give people the sense that it's just a commodity that you buy or that some pretense of breathe in, breathe out, I'm enlightened or anything like that. That this is this is both hard work and really when you come down to it, the only work worth doing in the world. Because if you're not living in your own experience in the present moment, then you're living in your thought stream in the past or in the future. And usually it's colored by worry or anxiety or perpetual planning. And nowadays also uh, endless self-distraction yes. because you can always like check your messages or do something to kind of um, avoid being in the present moment. Yeah. So this is a very, very big challenge for all of us. But the fact that it's so popular nowadays means that, in some sense, people are starving for this. So we literally are starving, and maybe you could even say dying for this. And mm -hmm. with everything that's going on in the world of terrorism and everything else, there are certain kinds of diseases that the human species is experiencing now globally, where you know, some people are so upset and so angry and feel so alienated that they're trying to kill other people to make the point, look how much I'm suffering, look how much you've caused me suffering without even knowing that you've yes. caused me suffering. And many people don't. Mm -hmm. And so this, there's never been a more important time on the planet for mindfulness to really become global, but to become global in the deepest and most ethical and most heartfelt of ways. And that has to do with um, a deep desire to actually be of benefit in this world for other people, not just for yourself. Yes. So, and I think Action for Happiness has that as part of your DNA, does it not? Sure. Yes, it does, yeah. And I know Chad Meng um, at Google, who wrote a book, and his sort of secret plan yeah, was... Yeah, I saw him last week, <laughs> and the week before. Yeah, you know, to, 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 to bring, bring about world peace, and, you know, given what you've said about you know, the current state of affairs in the world at the moment. Um, do you still hold on to the hope that, it, you know, I mean, I mean, that's a big ask, world peace and, you know, yeah. to change the world through one movement. But of course, we've got to, you know, how optimistic. I know that there's research that suggests that mindfulness does bring about greater compassion and empathy, yes. etc. Do, do you have, you know, a hope in that direction, you know, in terms of... I, I don't have... Uh a kind of unbridled hope, but I, I believe that I have a kind of realistic hope and aspiration for humanity. Mm -hmm. Because what is the alternative? Yes. If you think about it for a moment, the alternative to all this crazy, you know, is, is just more and more of this craziness until, you know, uh, the people who want to cause harm uh, get a hold of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm dirty bombs, anything, you know, just also to, like when, you know, that kind of mind is unbelievably toxic. Yeah. And so in a sense, we don't have any choice at this point in the moment on the planet mm -hmm. other than to uh, really 
recognize what's deepest and best in us as human beings, as a species, not as French people or English people or Americans or Syrians or mm -hmm. Iraqis, but as human beings. Yes. And instead of turning the other into a less than human that we can then destroy because of all the things we tell ourselves about how much they're to blame for my suffering, that we understand suffering and the nature of suffering in an entirely new way mm -hmm. and develop wisdom, the wisdom that we're capable of as human beings uh, that doesn't take personally things that are not personal and then works for the benefit of all beings, so to speak, by putting your, your shoulder to the wheel in ways that... Uh, make the society a more equitable, a better place where everybody can feel at home and not just say the wealthiest people in the society mm -hmm. and everybody else is hurting. Now, if you look at the political scene in the U.S. at this time, you can basically feel, even I'm guessing from the U.K. or from afar, how the whole thing is kind of, you know, sort of exploding and splitting apart. And there's so much implicit and explicit racism and hatred and, and disregard for the other. And, you know, that is not really tenable. And it's not a, a kind of credible way to conduct uh, the life of a country that takes care of its own in inhabitants and that also cares about its relationship with you know, other human beings in other countries in the world. So this is being played out on a colossal geopolitical scale at the same time that in our own private meditations it's played out on an individual scale or in our families on a family level or in our institutions and workplaces on that kind of a level. So there's no place in the society where mindfulness couldn't actually serve as a kind of Archimedes fulcrum to rotate uh, ourselves, allow ourselves to rotate in awareness, to rotate in consciousness so that we see things as they are instead of believing in our own, you know, self-generated uh, delusions and propaganda, which are often driven by greed and hatred. So it's not just everybody else that's being driven by greed, <clears throat> hatred and delusion, but we ourselves, and when we come to terms with that, when we recognize it in the meditation practice, in how we live our lives from moment to moment, <clears throat> then we can make room for other people in a way that is open-hearted and then begin to name the ways in which we need to actually undergo that rotation for the benefit of our own well-being and health and also for the benefit of the world. I take that incredibly seriously. And in fact, my book, uh, Coming to Our Senses, which is now, uh, you know, was written in 2004, so it's 11, 12 years old, it's got 100 pages in there on mindful politics. Because this is not just a matter of sitting quietly in a, you know, lotus position and, you know, pretending you're a statue in the British Museum. Yeah. Mm. Well, how... how motivated or how much encouragement do you get of where I guess the traje trajectory of mindfulness is going you know compared to where you began where, they, where you didn't have science to back you up yeah. and compared to the progress and you know, like you mentioned Time yeah. magazine you know you, you can't open up an, a, a newspaper nowadays or click on a, on a website without, that some, isn't, mention of without some mention of mindfulness Right. Does that give you yeah, great hope? it's because of the science. Let's be clear about that. And I'm trained as a scientist, and it yep. was very much a part of my strategy from the very beginning to not actually only offer meditation within the mainstream of medicine, but to actually document what the effects were on people. In other words, to do science on uh, the effects of fairly intensive and rigorous mindfulness practice and people who would never dream to be think of themselves as meditators, but who were suffering with chronic conditions of all kinds. Uh, and <clears throat> 37 years of mindfulness-based stress reduction, first at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center and now all around the world, mm -hmm. uh, have accumulated enormous uh, a body of evidence that this stuff really can change people's lives and that one of the mechanisms through which it changes people's lives is that the brain actually changes when you start to uh, relate to experience in systematic and repetitive ways. And that 
capacity of the brain is called neuroplasticity. And it now is understood that the brain is actually an organ of learning. And it goes on one's entire life. Not, and part of the way it does that is by changing its electrical activity on the basis of experience. But in another way that it does that is actually by restructuring what the neuroscientists would call its real estate, its structure, and its connectivity. So that the kind of uh, practice of mindfulness, for instance, could actually restructure, um, and there's lots of research showing this now, mm -hmm. um, connections in the brain to strengthen certain ones and attenuate other ones so that you actually do cultivate greater insight, greater equanimity, greater kindness, greater compassion, that these are sort of biological phenomena. Mm -hmm. And it's a tractable, learnable kind of thing. Uh, so now you ask me, well, how happy am I that that's come about? Uh, of course, I'm very happy that it's come about. As I mentioned, it comes with its associated risks because whenever anything becomes really popular, there's a tendency for everybody to jump on the bandwagon and not understand what it even is. Mm -hmm. But you have to use the word mindfulness now just to mm -hmm. seem like you're au courant with what everybody else is talking about. Mm -hmm. But what about, what about actually cultivating it in your own life? Mm -hmm. And as I said, that is serious and it involves a certain kind of interior sustained discipline over days, weeks, months, years, decades, and basically your whole life. And if we go that way as a species, then I think that's going to be up to the task of healing the planet, not just healing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we don't go that way, I don't think we even want to think about what the possible alternatives are, because when the human mind, when it gets seriously inflamed, and is driven by greed, hatred, and delusion, the levels of suffering that it causes, just look historically, are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And we can't afford to have millions and millions and millions of people die to get the message that we're fundamentally beautiful and okay, and we need to take care of each other and not just ourselves. Yeah. And we need to take care of the other creatures on the planet and the planet itself, because that's where we get our oxygen from the trees. And that's where we, you know, we get our water. And if the water is polluted, you know, and our cities, you know, if if the if the glaciers and the ice caps all melt, and we know this is happening, and we know that we are the cause of it, if our minds aren't capable collectively of transforming that in some way, mm -hmm. and they say time is very short to be able to do it without wreaking consequences, none of us want to talk about three or four or seven generations down the pipe, mm -hmm. then uh, we really need to discover what it means to be truly human and to align ourselves with deep wisdom and deep compassion. Mm -hmm. And nothing that I know of uh, except mindfulness is a kind of glide path into it that's been well worked out over thousands of years. So this is not something I made up in the basement of the UMass Medical Center in 1979. But how we apply it in the modern age, it's an ongoing evolution. It's not all about going back to the time of the Buddha or anything about, like that. And this is not about becoming a Buddhist either. I am not a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. I'm a serious student of Buddhist meditation, but I don't identify as a Buddhist simply because I think it's enough for me personally to just identify as a human. Yeah. And if I were to identify as a Buddhist, then people would think that maybe I had an ulterior motive of sure. teaching other people meditation so secretly turn them into Buddhists. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is not about Buddhism. And even the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. Yes. It's about a deep core human wisdom that the Buddha, think of him as a scientist or a great doctor, and he's spoken of in both those ways, yeah. had deep insights about the nature of mind, the nature of suffering, and how to we liberate ourselves as, as an individual and as a human beings, as a species, from that suffering. Yeah. And uh, that to me is universal. It has nothing to do with becoming a Buddhist. Yes, yes. Uh, Just like, you know, like say Newton 
uh, who happened to be a Christian, you know, was the father right. of modern physics. The law of gravity is That's a right. Christian. Yeah. yeah, we don't we don't refer to physics as as a Christian. It's just a human universal truth. Because, well, the word dharma yes. that is describes the teachings of the Buddha means lawfulness, mm. and of course, what what uh, Newton discovered were the laws of physics, the laws of gravitation, again, lawfulness. So it's just the way things are when they operate in a certain kind of lawful way. So if you grasp onto something, for instance, one of these mindfulness teachings is that the more you grasp and self-identify, the more suffering you will generate for yourself and for other people. So to bring awareness to grasping and clinging, which is the kind of root cause of addiction, uh, and to be able to open and not cling when you feel the impulse to cling, that's wisdom. And if you keep practicing that, if you exercise that muscle, then you can free yourself from all sorts of habitual addictions, not just drug addictions or alcohol, or, but, but from the addiction of busyness, for instance, or the addiction of uh, self-centeredness. And the amount of harm that is caused by that kind of clinging is enormous. So this has, again, it may have been discovered and extremely beautifully articulated in Buddhism, but when we teach MBSR, we're not teaching Buddhism, sure. but we are teaching that lawfulness. Mm -hmm. But in modern ways that regular people can understand and can enact and embody in their own lives. Well, I just so wanted to talk is this about, making sense to it, you? Oh, buddy? very much so, yes. Um, on your point about the addiction to self-centeredness and sort of whilst the modern day technology, the tools that we have has enabled this conversation and you yes. know, it has, has, has brought about so much You're sitting good. in the UK and I'm sitting yeah. in Massachusetts. And we're having you know, a wonderful conversation. And at the same time, it's also a tool to feed this addiction of self-centeredness amongst the young in particular, where you know, every, every, every meal, every occasion has to be sort of backed up with a selfie, a photo, just to, you know. Thank you. And, and I think that there's some concern that in that area that needs to be addressed, I think, in education. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you young people saying that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, because again, you get addicted to the iPhone. Yeah. And in fact, I know the people who designed the iPhone. Uh, all those technologies are designed for maximal addiction. Yeah. Are uh, they really designed that way? Um, and so to liberate yourself from the attachment to always having to check your messages or to find out how many people liked some comment that you posted on Facebook. Mm. Every time you check and people like what you posted, you get a little squirt of dopamine. Mm. And it's kind of like a drug reaction and you say, oh, this feels so good. And five seconds later you have to check again because you want another squirt of do dopamine. And so basically you become addicted to a story out there in the internet it's not at all true, but that has to do with how do I present myself so that more people will like me and think I'm clever and so forth. And this is a disease. Uh, it has wonderful elements to it, but it also has these disease elements to it. And I recommend for anybody who's watching this program and listening uh, to read the last two books by Sherry Turkle from MIT, who studies the effects of the technology on young people and uh, social behavior. The books are called Alone Together where, you know, you may be connected to the entire world through your phone, but you feel more and more alone and isolated. Mm -hmm. And the other is called Reclaiming Conversation, where, you know, people keep conversation at a very, very superficial level now because they're always busy checking, you know, their phones or Google to find out, oh, somebody mentioned something. You don't keep the conversation going. You check to get information. And there's a very big difference between information and connectivity. Yes. Or between, for that matter, information and knowledge. Mm. And then, and this is more uh, about computers and the technology in general. So we're like a real information society. But what about the knowledge that derives from that information when you understand? And then what comes from that knowledge is understanding. But what's the point of understanding even unless you take it on to wisdom? And what would wisdom be? That would be a much larger apprehending of the actuality of things and how they are deeply interconnected and what causes greater happiness 
or great causes greater suffering. And then to choose, when possible, to tilt things in the direction of greater happiness and well-being and not in the direction of greater suffering and harm. Mm. And that's a, cogn that's a function of not just merely the intellect, it's a function of awareness itself. It's a function of the heart. So in an all Asian languages, you probably know this better than I do, the word for mind and the word for heart is often the same word. Mm. So when you hear, when we hear in English the word mindfulness, if we're not hearing the word heartfulness, we're really not understanding it. We're turning into some kind of cognitive uh, operation instead of understanding that it has a vast number of different dimensions. So it, we don't understand awareness from a scientific point of view very well. I mean, or sentience would be another way to put it. But, you know, this sort of this is a kind of miraculous gift that we have as human beings, and yet we don't know how to live inside awareness without being caught in the addiction and in the thought stream and emotional reactivity. And that's where the mindfulness actually you train to actually shift your default mode from one of constant thinking and being lost in thought and self-distracted to one of being present with no agenda other than to be awake. Yeah. And then trusting that all your intelligences, plural, will come online and be more available to you for whatever is most appropriate uh, in the present moment, whether it's to act or whether it's to be still and mm -hmm. simply be present in silence. Okay. So you mentioned in some of your previous interviews that we as a society, we do not examine the I enough. Yeah, the personal pronoun. The personal pronoun. And so, you know, what Anne's explained to me and, you know, after two years of meditation, where you're constantly, for my 15 minutes, I'm going to sit there and every thought that I come in, I want to take a breath and then almost as if on a screen, I can watch it. And because of that, there's almost a separation that happens. Yeah. And that was a quite profound moment for me where I could... Oh crap. So then everything that I've previously perceived about my life and who I am also comes from this same place of, you know, these thousands and thousands of thoughts that we have every day. Yeah. So perhaps and you see who's who's thinking those thoughts. Exactly. And who's meditating even. Yes. Yeah. Are so we are we see, the person behind the eyes? Are we just exactly. sat behind or? So this is really important and the questions are much more important than the what we would call dime store answers that your mind will come up with. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know, and I had one Zen teacher from Korea for many years who stressed not knowing. Mm -hmm. The the mind that doesn't know. Yeah. But that knows that it doesn't know. Yeah. That's one facet of wisdom. So that way you can at least write yourself restraining orders not to do things that are just going to create more addiction and more mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. Yes. And then, well, what will I replace it with? Don't know. Well, stay open. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll learn something new for yeah. the first time. Maybe you'll see something new for the first time. Yes. Maybe you'll connect with somebody mm -hmm. fresh in a way that you never thought you could connect before. Mm -hmm. And then you're starting to learn. And out of that process of ongoing moment-by-moment moment learning, you're starting to grow. And your ideas about yourself and who you think you are are starting to expand into the total, the totality of who you are. And therefore, there's a certain kind of healing that goes on, which is a kind of coming to terms or to peace with the way things are, like you have this face and not that face, or this body and not that body, mm -hmm. or this illness and not that illness, or, you know, whatever it is, that we make peace with it, that's the core of healing. It's not the same as curing, mm -hmm. but when you embrace it in that kind of way, the body, it's not just the brain that's plastic, the genome is plastic, the chromosomes mm -hmm. are plastic, the, the, the telomeres that are responsible for mm -hmm. biological aging and cell senescence, they also respond to meditation practice in a disciplined mm -hmm. way. So there's never been a better time, according to the science, for us to actually dive deeply into these questions of, of who am I, the nature of self, which is, of course, what psychology is all supposed to be about anyway, mm -hmm. and to maybe cultivate new ways of being in wise relationship with experience. Yeah. Okay? And then if we don't know exactly, I mean, of course, I know that I'm John Kabat-Zinn. I wouldn't mistake myself for somebody with another name, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just a name. Mm 
Yeah. And so part of wisdom is seeing, you know, what's in the name. Mm-hmm. You know, a rose by another name would smell as sweet. You know, Shakespeare, like incredible wisdom in Shakespeare. Yeah. In, you know, social wisdom, and emotional wisdom, cognitive wisdom, right in Shakespeare or right in Dante. I mean, it's not something that's only in meditative traditions. I mean, it's like we're talking about the full dimensionality of being human and then how to live with sure. integrity. Yeah. And your way of doing it, whoever you are, is going to be somewhat different from my way of doing it mm-hmm. and different from your way of doing it. But we can have a kind of mutual respect and regard. And look, the two of you were working together. I'm sure at some point you didn't even know each other. Mm-hmm. And now, like, you know, so you're not you and you're not you, but together you can do something that probably neither of you could do apart. There's something very beautiful about that. And, mm-hmm. of course, that's also true for parents. Like, you know, I mean, that's how children are born. You know, and so there's a huge de- degree of mystery in all of this, yeah. uh, but it, a lot of it has to do with not taking personally what's really not personal. And when we build huge stories around my suffering or my anger or my fear, and then we don't know that that's a kind of yeah, on a conventional level, it's all true, and it's not my anger; it's your anger. Mm-hmm. But but you, since you don't know who you are, maybe your anger is just a kind of habit. Mm-hmm. And it's not really who you are. It's just some kind of silly habit that you've gotten into. Whenever something gets triggered, you react mindlessly. Yeah. Or when you feel hurt, then you get sad mindlessly. Yeah. And does it help the situation? Never. <laughs> never. No. Only never. Yeah. So rather than fighting with the way things are or mm-hmm. fighting with the universe, you'll always lose. Mm-hmm. What about befriending the actuality of your experience and learning over and over and over again how to rest in awareness, stay in the knowing and the not knowing, and not necessarily in the story of me, personal pronoun. Because the story of me, no matter how true it is and no matter how wonderful it is, it's just way too small. Mm